Church, shall we dance? We shall. Hi, I'm Pastor Mike of Namioki United Methodist Church. Every Sunday we have two morning worship services at Namioki. The first begins at 8.15am, it's a laid back traditional service, and the second service begins at 10.30am. It's a blended family friendly service for people of all ages. We'd love to see you this coming Sunday, 1900 Pontoon Road in Granite City, Illinois, just minutes away from the mighty Mississippi River and the heart of the city of St. Louis. Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation 
and given new birth through water and spirit. All this is God's gift offered to us without price. Mike and Jen, on behalf of the whole church and on behalf of Max, I ask you, do you believe in God and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments? We do. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? We do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? We do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord in union with the church, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? We do. According to the grace given you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? We will. Mike and Jen, and Max's godparents, Brad and Stacy, will you nurture Max in Christ's holy church that by, teach, by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life. We will. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? We do. Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include Max now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround Max with love and forgiveness, that he may grow in his service to others. We will pray for him, that he may be a true disciple, who walks in the way that leads to life. Little child, for you Jesus came, for you he struggled, for you he suffered, for you he endured the darkness of Calvary, and for you he triumphed over death, for you. And you, little child, know nothing of this, but this we do affirming the words of the Apostle, we love because God first loved us. Let us pray. O eternal God, pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and Max who will receive it. Throughout his life, wash away his sin and clothe him in righteousness that dying and being raised in Christ, Max may share in his final victory. Amen. This may be the strangest question I've ever asked someone in a baptism ceremony, but what name is given this child? <laughs> Maxwell Samuel Dean Rayson. Maxwell Samuel Dean Rayson, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May God open your ears to hear God's word, your eyes to see God at work, and your mouth, which is going to open very quickly, <laughs> to proclaim God's praise. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, grant that Max, as he grows in years, may also grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that by the restraining and renewing influence of the Holy Spirit, he may ever be a true child of yours, serving you faithfully all his days. So guide and uphold Mike and Jen, and Max's brother and sisters, Laura, Oliver, and Kaylee, that by loving care, wise counsel, and holy example, they may lead Max into that life of faith, whose strength is righteousness, and whose fruit is everlasting joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Amen. So friends, would you welcome Max, who has been baptized into the family of faith. The first reading is in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax lists. The first enrollment occurred when Quirinius governed Syria. Everyone went to their own cities to be enrolled. Since Joseph belonged to David's house and family line, he went up from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to David's city, called Bethlehem, in Judea. He went to be enrolled together with Mary, who was promised to him in marriage, and who was pregnant. Mary to have her baby. She gave birth to her firstborn child, a son, wrapped him snugly and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the guest room.
after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. The star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chests and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And glory. 
I would invite you to pray with me for just a moment. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this evening actually brings us to the close of a sermon series here that we have been traveling through this Advent at Namioki United Methodist Church. But I'm not going to get to actually the theme of the sermon series to the very end. Politics and crooked politicians, unjust taxes and the wish of the ruling class to impose even more, political manoeuvring, occupation, murder, war, dissension, dictatorships and egomaniacal leaders. This is not a sermon about modern day America. This is a homily about a fella by the name of Gaius Octavius. Now Octavius was born into a wealthy ruling family. His uncle shared the same name, Gaius. And his uncle happened to be one of the most well-known politicians of all time. Now, Uncle Gaius was also known by another name. I'll tell you that in a little bit. But Uncle Gaius was murdered at the age of 54. And he had no male heir to be his successor. He had one daughter, Julia, but she couldn't inherit her father's titles and possessions because she was, well, a girl. He did have an illegitimate son, but illegitimate sons are not allowed to inherit in this day and age either. Now, this illegitimate son would go on to be murdered himself at the age of 17 by his father's nephew. You guessed it, none other than our good friend, Gaius Octavius. The murdered son had been born, believe it or not, to the queen of a neighbouring country. But that queen was only Uncle Gaius's mistress, not his wife. Uncle Gaius actually had three wives. His first wife died, he got divorced from his second wife, and remained married to his third wife until his murder. He also took for himself three mistresses. The Queen of Egypt, the Queen of what is today modern-day Morocco, and a woman by the name of Servilia, not a queen, but the mother of the man who would end up murdering Uncle Gaius. This is one messed up family that I'm glad I wasn't born into. So if you're still following, Uncle Gaius dies at the hands of the son of his mistress. His nephew Gaius is, went on to murder his own step cousin, born to the uncle's other mistress, the Queen of Egypt. And upon his death, Uncle Garrett, Gaius heir apparent was not any of his children. He, it was his nearest blood relative, you guessed it, his nephew inherited Gaius Octavius. He was named in the will, and because he was named in the will, and he was the nearest male relative, this meant that on his death, Uncle Gaius legally and posthumously adopted his murderous nephew as a son. Now, if you think that's messed up, it gets even messier than that. When Uncle Gaius died, the countries of which he was a known leading politician were split up into three sections, each of them controlled by a military dictator. One of whom was, you guessed it, our good friend Gaius Octavius. But it gets even better. These three military dictators didn't like each other, Mark, Marcus and Gaius. Now Mark and Gaius decided to get rid of Marcus, who at that point had also become the head priest in the state religion of the time and had more influence than Mark or Gaius. But when Mark and Gaius combined forces, they were able to top us, topple Marcus from his religious and military posts and set him into exile. Now that leaves Gaius and Mark in charge, right? Mark, however, fancied himself the former mistress to Uncle Gaius. You guessed it, the Queen of England, the woman that had given that illegitimate son who would go on to be murdered by our friend Gaius Octavius. Now, she was a young woman when Uncle Gaius took her as a mistress, so when she met Mark, she was still of childbearing age. They got married and had children, and together they plotted against Gaius Octavius, but lost the battle. Mark was branded a traitor and committed suicide. The Queen of Egypt did the same thing. She used a snake bite to do the deadly deed. And their only son, the one born to, sorry, her only son, the one that was born to Uncle Gaius, was named the new king of Egypt. But that didn't last very long, because Gaius Octavius swept in and murdered him. So you're still following? This is a messy story, isn't it? 
Maybe it's time to reveal the characters in this story by their better known names. Uncle Gaius, and Gaius was his real name, was known by his second name, Julius. Julius Caesar. The Queen of Egypt, Caesar's last mistress, and the wife of Mark Antony was Cleopatra. Caesar's second mistress, Servilia's child, from another relationship who ended up murdering Caesar? Well, that was et tu, Brutus. The three men who became dictators of the Roman Republic after Caesar's death at the hands of his lover's son, Marcus Lepidus, who was also Potiphar Maximus, a title that would go on to be used for popes when Christendom became the official religion of the Roman Empire, Mark Antony, the husband of Cleopatra, and the young man who started all this, the murderer of his uncle's only male son, Caesarian, after he was named the Pharaoh of Egypt, the illegitimate son between Cleopatra and Caesar 17 years earlier, Gaius Octavius. Or as he became known after he got Lepidus and Antony out of the way, no, I'm not going to tell you his name. I'm going to read to you from the Bible. Because our little friend, Gaius Octavius, appears in the Christmas story. Bet you didn't see that twist coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's what the story says. In those days, Caesar Augustus declared that everyone throughout the empire should be enrolled in the tax lists. Octavius was better known as Caesar Augustus, the first Roman Empire emperor. He wasn't no longer a politician. He seized all the power there could to be seized. He toppled off all of his sworn enemies and he became king. Now politics, they say, don't belong in the pulpit. Well, Jesus was born into a political climate that was literally life or death for some. Caesar Augustus was not a kind and benevolent leader of the Roman Empire. Some historians have said his reign was largely peaceful, but it wasn't real peace. It was peace by strong arm tactics. It was peace by underhanded political dealings. And it was peace by murder in the first degree. And let's not forget about money. The Christmas story begins by reminding us that Joseph and Mary have to make a long and arduous journey south from their home in Nazareth to register for a census, or as the contemporary English Bible puts it, to be enrolled in the tax lists. Now, a census in Roman times was not about compiling accurate figures about how many people lived in that house or this, or whether the owner was Hispanic or Latino. They were questions, by the way, asked on the last US census. A Roman census was for one reason only, to identify who it was that should be paying taxes to Caesar Augustus and the Roman Empire. Who should be filling the coffers of Julius Caesar's nephew, who killed his cousin, banished his rivals, and turned the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire? A cruel and occupying killing machine that was all about making Rome the center of the universe, the wealthiest, most powerful, most dangerous, and most feared regime on planet Earth. And unto this world, a child was born. Into this world, a son was given. Now perhaps you understand Isaiah's prophecy a little more. And the government, said Isaiah, will be upon his shoulders. From the very beginning, the government was on the shoulders of Jesus' family. Leave Nazareth. Go to Bethlehem, the city of your family. Make sure you're registered on the tax rolls and pay your taxes, or likely off with your head. The government continues to be on the shoulders of the Holy Family when the edict goes out to kill all the firstborn boys and they flee to Egypt. Yet despite the climate of political corruption and dictatorship Jesus was born into, despite the government upon their shoulders, his name, shall be called, says Isaiah, Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Despite Caesar Augustus seeking to rake the world of its wealth and possessions and to conquer her people by force and aggression, Isaiah's prophecy goes on to remind us that there will be vast authority and endless peace for David's throne and for his kingdom, establishing and sustaining it with justice and righteousness now and forever. Imagine, if you will, the power of that particular prophecy, not just for us, us who read it through the lens of Jesus, but to those who heard it in the time of Isaiah, some 700 or so years before the time of Jesus. 
In fact, this prophecy was penned eight years before the people of God were about to face terror like they'd never known. The king of Assyria was coming and Jerusalem was going to be attacked. And after that, a while later, the king of Babylon came and destroyed Jerusalem again, this time taking away her peoples in chains in what we know as the Exodus. And it would be 150 years more before Jerusalem would be restored again under the prophet Nehemiah, a Jew born in exile and living in Persia, working for the king. He returned to rebuild Jerusalem. Jerusalem is rebuilt after decades and decades of ruin in the 400 BCs. But still the people of God didn't get it. Still they turned to their own way. Still they spurned God. And the prophet Malachi, the last, <coughs> the last of his line, tried to tell the people of God to turn back. But they said, and this comes from Malachi chapter 3, which is the last book in the Old Testament and the last book chronologically as well. Serving God is useless. What do we have to gain by keeping his obligation or by walking around as mourners before the Lord of the heavenly forces? And Malachi responds to that with this final epitaph, the final verse of Malachi chapter 4. Turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. And after that, nothing. Silence. Silence. For the next 400 years, God remained silent. No prophet came to speak on God's behalf. No encounter with God was recorded by a priest or a king. No stories of God's redemption exist. 400 years of complete, absolute silence and chaos. Israel and Palestine were still under Babylonian rule. Rome was conquered by the Gauls. Alexander the Great conquered much of the Middle East and Hellenized it, which means he... He dominated whatever the prevailing culture was in any countries that he uh, conquered with Greek culture, which is why, by the way, most of the New Testament is written in Greek. Then Egypt started throwing its weight around in the area. Syria did the same until Romans marched in and conquered again under the empire of Gaius Octavius, whom we know as Caesar Augustus. These were bloody and evil and turbulent times. The true people of God who kept the faith during those 400 years of silence and violence to this point were just a remnant. It was like God had packed up and gone on a 400-year vacation, probably to Australia, <laughs> which was pretty peaceful back then because it would be another 1,700 years before the colonists would take away the land from the Aboriginal peoples. And God really likes Australia. He doesn't care too much for New Zealand, I'm told. <laughs> Too cold and too many earthquakes, but Australia, perfect place to hide for 400 years. <clears throat> Jesus was born after 400 years of deafening silence. And it was a silence that would be broken in an extraordinary way. To an elderly priest going about his duties in the temple. I mean, God hadn't said anything for millennia. And suddenly, one day out of the blue, and completely unexpected... To a priest going through the religious motions in the temple, God speaks through the angel Gabriel with the words, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will give birth to your son and you must name him John. He will make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And then the angel appeared again, this time to a young teenager in Nazareth. Rejoice, favoured one. The Lord is with you. Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honouring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. And then to Joseph, to whom Mary is engaged. Don't be afraid, says the angel to Joseph, to take Mary as your wife. The child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And then, taking a few more angels for moral support, God speaks through, through the angel Gabriel to the shepherds, washing their socks and watching their flocks by night. Do not be afraid. I bring good news, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Saviour is born today in David's city, and he is Christ the Lord. And this is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. Do you see a pattern emerging in the story? Do not be afraid. Afraid? If the last time God was ever recorded speaking to someone was when Christopher Columbus was crossing the ocean blue, 
Or those at the court of King Jimmy decided to print the Bible in English back in 1611, and suddenly in 2016, God pops up and says, Hi, Mike, do not be afraid. I'm going to need a dry cleaner. <laughs> Every Christmas we celebrate the clean birth of God. God, Father, Son, and Spirit, born into a clean stable, a healthy manger, to two bright and happy individuals called Mary and Job. And at this pretty major scene with the cattle lowing and the baby awakes and the little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes. Well, there's probably no baby spit in this story, no poopy diapers, no colic, and definitely no peeing between swaddling clothes changing all over my office floor. <laughs> Don't worry, I cleaned it up. And we decorate and we host parties and we give each other toaster ovens and coffee mugs and Red Ryder BB guns with which to shoot our eyes out. And we forget, we forget in this clean Christmas that Jesus is born into a country and into a world that was in a bigger mess than our world is in today. Under an emperor who wanted more and more and more taxes. An emperor who dispatched his enemies with efficiency, murdered his nephew, conspired against those who thought he was a friend and established the brutal Roman Empire. Who conquered their way across nations by raping and pillaging the entire world at the time. The Roman Empire was not a peaceful revolution. It was a nasty, ugly, murderous regime that took what they wanted when they wanted it and cared nothing for consequence. And this Jesus, our Jesus, is born into this world of sedition and deceit and lies and genocide and rape and murder and egomaniacal leadership. The Prince of Peace, they called him, born into the worst of times. Or the Prince of Peace, born into God's perfect time. It's not been a good year this year. The world has said goodbye to a great many great people. Prince, Glenn Fry from the Eagles, David Bowie, Harper Lee who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, John Glenn the astronaut, Leonard Cohen, Merle Haggard, the actor Alan Rickman, Gene Wilder, Muhammad Ali, Natalie Cole, Pete Burns, Zaza Gabor, and even Florence Henderson, or as we knew her, Carol, Carol Brady. We've seen terrorist attacks and mall attacks and attacks overseas at Christmas markets. We've seen the Zika virus. We have seen in our own country alone 14,500 people dying from a gunshot wound just this year. We've heard a lot this year about police officers losing their lives at the hands of criminals with guns. There have been 62 officers that have made that sacrifice this year. But did you know that 655 children under the age of 11 have been killed in the United States in 2016 by gunfire? A further 2015 teenagers between the age of 11 and 17 have died in the same manner. And the year ain't over yet. By my calculations, we have another 283 murders to take place by gunshot between today and New Year's Day. In 2016, Hasbro, the makers of the game Monopoly, set up a hotline to solve Monopoly disputes after a study came out that said 51% of all Monopoly games end in an argument. 100% of Monopoly games end in an argument when I'm playing. <laughs> and I haven't even mentioned American politics tonight. Or maybe I have, who knows. And our families have experienced pain too. The loss of children, suicide, illness, cancer. We have two people in our church suffering with leukemia. Grandparents being shut out of their children and grandchildren's lives. We've been at war with each other over politics and policies and doctrine and dogma. And people have left the church with their pants tied up in knots. And even worse, an Australian became a US citizen on November the 4th. God save us all. And into this mess comes Jesus, the Prince of Peace, born into the worst of times, born into God's perfect time. Because Jesus knows about turbulent times. A poor and vulnerable brown baby born to an unwed teenage mother in a smelly barn somewhere in a town of no repute in the Middle East. A family forced out of their home a couple of hundred miles north, forced to walk south to that little town because of some tyrant's tax policy. 
A mother and father and a child escaping that town and running away as illegal immigrants to Egypt to escape the spectre of death hanging over their child's head because the mighty were scared that a little child might eventually lead them. And some of the first people to come visit that vulnerable baby, a bunch of Eastern mystics from countries even then that were known to harbour terrorists and mercenaries. If the story of the birth of Jesus is true, and I believe that it is, God came as a gift of peace into the hell of our human existence. God came as a gift of peace to the poor, to the hungry, to the disenfranchised, to the outcast, to the powerless, and even to those that some would call the enemies of Christendom. Jesus was born to Muslims and Hindus and all manner of other people following other religions. And into this darkness of our world, Jesus proclaims, do not be afraid. A light is shining. Welcome to a new world, a world of hope, of redemption, a world where you don't need to be afraid anymore. For in the birth of this baby, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. You see, thanks to the gift of the Prince of Peace, even Ebenezer Scrooge, who we've been talking about all the Sundays of Advent, even Ebenezer Scrooge can be rehabilitated by the presence and the power of the Christ child among us. And I leave you with this, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Bob Cratchit! So here you are. Uh, Mr. Scrooge, uh... You, sir, were not at work this morning as we had discussed. Uh, but, but, Mr. Scrooge, sir, we did discuss it. It's Christmas Day. You gave me the day off. I? I, Ebenezer Scrooge? <laughs> Would I do a thing like that? No. Uh, I mean, yes, but, but you did. Bob Cratchit, I've had my fill of this. <laughs> and I have had my fill of you, Emily, Mr. Scrooge! Emily, Mr. And Scrooge. therefore, Bob Cratchit. And therefore, you can leave this house at once! And therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. Oh! to raise you right off the pavement or onto the... Daddy? Pardon? Yes, Bob. Raise your salary and pay your mortgage on this house. <laughs> um, oh. <laughs> uh, uh, please, sir, uh, come inside. Oh, yes, uh, uh, yes. Bob Cratchit, would you and your family care to join us for a little turkey dinner on this fine Christmas day? Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry, Merry Christmas! Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> than his word. He did it all and infinitely more. And, uh, Tiny Tim? And Tiny Tim, who did not die... Oh, isn't that swell? <laughs> to Tiny Tim, Scrooge became a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city ever had. <laughs> and it was always <laughs> said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas yeah. well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. <laughs> May that truly be said of us and all of us. And so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us. God bless us, everyone.
Learning to be loved just like I always was Learning to be loved by you